Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here and welcome to my guide to Eureka Orthos, the latest deep dungeon added in patch 6.35. This guide is going to be a long one given we have a hundred floors of enemies and details to go over to get you through in one piece. Please use the timestamps in the description of the video to find what you need. First, the basics. Eureka Orthos is what we call a deep dungeon. It is a 100 floor excursion through randomly generated rooms and dangerous boss fights while collecting temporary items to help combat the threats inside. Floors will have random layouts with a random assortment of monsters per set of floors and even grant beneficial or detrimental effects randomly to your party. Unlocking Eureka Orthos requires the completion of Palace of the Dead Floor 50 and the 6.0 Endwalker MSQ. After that, it can be unlocked in Mordona by speaking to Ko Rabinta and following her quest lines. There will be additional quests for story after completing Floors 30 and 100. Once unlocked, Eureka Orthos may only be entered by speaking to Katun in Mordona. You can also speak to Burnell next to the Mordona Etherite to quickly teleport you to Katun after unlocking the dungeon. You may enter the dungeon in one of two methods. Matched parties act as the dungeon's equivalent to the duty finder, finding three other players at random to assist you. These groups will reset their temporary items inside between every set of floors and may not go past the boss at floor 30. Fixed parties are made up of whoever is in your party when you queue up, up to a maximum of four people. These parties can progress past floor 30 so long as they have never suffered a failed duty for any reason. If the party fully wipes or every player disconnects, you will be disallowed from continuing the attempt to go past floor 30 and must start over. Fixed parties must also progress all the way through without changing members or jobs. Whatever job you pick and players you are with must be the same the whole way up or again, you'll be forced to start over. Both of these types of parties may only start from floors one at first, though a floor 21 start point unlocks after clearing floor 30. There are no higher starting floors for fixed parties. You also retain two saves for the content, so if you need to free up a save, be sure to use the reset progress option at Katoon. Every party member will need an available save in order to enter. Finally, while cross-world parties work, all members must be in Mordona and in the same instance, though they got rid of the instance before I even released this video because it was causing issues, so just be in Mordona for now. Now before entering, there are a few more things you may find useful to know. First up, there are three types of chests inside of Orthos. Bronze chests drop Hyper Potions, Phoenix Downs, and Orthos Fragments, which can be exchanged for Orthos Potions at the Synthesis node right outside the entrance. There are other rewards, but that's definitely the most useful one for actually progressing. On floors 1 to 30, they can also become mimics, but they can be both stunned and interrupted. Silver chests are largely used to obtain upgrades to Aether Pool Arm and Armor, which we'll briefly discuss in a moment. You can also obtain temporary items called Demi Clones from them, or they'll just explode in your face. The explosion does percentage max health damage, so don't open them if you're missing some health. On floors 31 to 60, silver chests can also be mimics, but are still susceptible to stuns and interrupts. Finally, gold chests provide temporary items called protomanders and can become mimics after floor 61. From this floor onwards, mimics cannot be stunned, only interrupted. Job soloing without interrupts should expect to receive the pox debuff occasionally from the infatuation skill. There are also accursed horde style chests hidden throughout the map. They are only unveiled if a player stands near one's invisible location long enough. Their location can be unveiled with a Protomander of Intuition temporary item and grants random rewards from Valorone right next to Katoon outside the dungeon. Floors 1 to 30 provide bronze sacks, floors 31 through 70 provide silver, and floors 71 to 98 gold. Accursed Hordes only grant these item sacks upon completion of a set of 10 floors, so if you wipe or fail the duty for any reason, you will not collect them upon exiting. Once inside, all players will be set to level 81 if starting on floor 1, or level 90 if starting on floor 21. Equipment has no effect here, and instead you must raise your Aether Pool arm and armor stats in your Orthos character sheet to gain more power. You might have obtained some of these back in Palace of the Dead, but the upgrades over there do not transfer here. All the Deep Dungeon, Aether Pool arm and armor are separate. These upgrades are obtained from Silver Chests and upon defeating any boss from floor 30 and above. 
If your ether pool level is too high for the floors that you are on, it will be synced down so you won't be too strong and silver chests may fail to provide an actual upgrade. You can also exchange 10 ether pool arm and armor collectively to obtain one ether pool grip. You can exchange three grips for an item level 620 weapon and an additional six along with the first weapon for an upgraded item level 625 weapon. You will also have access to a number of temporary items called protomanders and demiclones. Protomanders provide a variety of effects, most of which you should be familiar from your Palace of the Dead experience prior to unlocking this. Some new ones do appear here though. Protomander of Lethargy slows enemy attack and cast speeds massively. Protomander of Storms reduces every enemy on the floor's HP to 1 except on boss floors, and Protomanders of Dread transform the player into a Dreadnought, allowing them to either one-shot most enemies or fire a stacking vulnerability up. Beware of any no-knockback debuff floors, as this debuff will actually prevent the Dreadnought from one-shotting enemies. An additional note about Lethargy that I was made aware of by the Deep Dungeon community while I was making this guide. There are enemies on later floors that cast room-sized AoEs that will instantly kill you if you're hit by them. Now, Lethargy slows that cast down and is supposed to make them easier to deal with. However, if they are off-screen and not loaded into your field of view and they start casting said ability with Lethargy on, there's a chance you could walk into their field of view and not see that they're casting it at all. This is a Lethargy specific thing apparently and I'm just giving you the forewarning if you're using the protomander to give an additional note for those types of enemies like you're seeing on the screen right now. Big thanks to Pillowy Zeal for letting me know that so I could throw it in the guide. Demi clones, on the other hand grant you a temporary AI ally that will assist you until the summoning player dies or you complete the current singular floor you are on. Une provides support granting stone skin and cures while attacking enemies. Doga provides crowd control and damage, petrifying enemies occasionally and nuking them with black magic spells. Onion Knight deals massive amounts of damage with his attacks, making him great for quickly dispatching foes, especially bosses. A single player may only have one demi-clone assisting them at a time, but every party member can have their own, so you can really show up with the entourage on bosses. Now for the actual dungeon itself. The first nine floors in any set will be laden with enemies and chests. Some will reside within rooms while others will wander the halls. You must kill a random number of enemies, usually up to a maximum of 12, in order to open the pylon of passage and progress to the next floor. All players in the group must stand in it for a few seconds, and everyone must be out of combat. The pylon of return may also activate, allowing any alive players to use it to resurrect dead allies. Phoenix Downs and Raises are also effective for this, though Phoenix Downs only outside of combat. On these floors, the rooms may even have traps in them. In fact, almost every single one, except for your starting room, will. They are normally invisible. However, a protomander of sight reveals their location on the ground, and a protomander of safety removes them from the floor altogether. Here is a quick legend on the screen of what they look like and what they do. Enervation and polymorph traps should be avoided at all costs. Luring traps will spawn three enemies that must be dispatched, which often forces some form of protomander to be used to counter, such as a witching. However, if you're confident, you can use these, especially on the early floors, to just get a couple more enemies to kill before you move on up. The landmine traps will deal a large percentage of your current health as damage, which can never be lethal on its own. These also damage enemies, so you can abuse them to greatly lower enemy health so be careful not to get yourself killed by anything else in the process. Enemies also have various aggro types. Most enemies, especially on the earlier floors, will aggro by sight, meaning you must step in their cone of vision in order for them to attack. Some will aggro by sound, which means you can avoid them by using the walk hotkey and just strolling by. Proximity aggro just means that being anywhere near them will force them to attack, and these are usually the highest priority enemies for you to go after. There is also technically touch aggro. Normally, when you try to walk directly through the hitbox of a sound aggro enemy, it may ignore the fact that you're walking and just attack you all the same. Since it really only happens with sound aggro, I recommend just trying to avoid ever walking directly through the hitbox of an enemy. Finally, you may get a warning that a dread beast has appeared on a floor. This spawns one of three boss enemies that is much more powerful than the others. They pose an extreme risk to the party, though defeating them grants a 30 minute buff and a gold chest. I have a whole separate video about these that covers their effects, skills, and methods of dealing with them, which is really mostly avoiding them. 
Fortunately, they all aggro sight. So if you want to avoid them, you have to walk behind them. But I would advise waiting until you see them turn so you know they won't suddenly turn and then just wipe you out. Now the 10th floor in every set will be a boss instead. Defeating it finishes the set and allows the party to exit and take a break before entering the next set of 10 floors. Keep in mind that if the boss isn't defeated before the 60 minute timer ends, the duty will fail. Now all of this does have an exception in the final 10 floors, but we'll get to that later. Finally, we get to talk about each of the set of floors, and I can't stress enough how important it is to understand and pay attention to every random enemy. While not every random attack or AOE is lethal, many of them are, even to tanks and even on the lower floors. Bosses usually have a few attacks that don't one-shot, but it's not like you want to get hit by those either. Please use the timestamps to jump around the video because, like I said, it's going to be a long one. For floors 1 through 9, just avoid enemy AoEs that you see. On these floors, AoE indicators will be abundant and attacks minimally threatening. Just try not to gap close or animation lock yourself too frequently, as that can easily get you caught, especially with multiple enemies. Keep in mind that bronze chests are mimics here, and accursed hordes will also reward bronze sacks. Honestly, the most dangerous enemy in this set is the Orthos Grenade. Their big burst cast bar will have a delayed point blank indicator, something you will become very familiar with later on. But being hit by this is almost certainly lethal. Stun it or run away when you see the big burst cast. Now behemoths are also a little scary. When they are at low health, they begin casting Ecliptic Meteor, which will one hit kill any party members in range. Fortunately, you can kill them before this finishes pretty easily, but if you find yourself in a bad situation, you can even line of sight this by putting a wall between you and the behemoth. This will be mandatory for later floor enemies, so it is a good idea to understand how to do it now. Fatchins also have a gaze attack to look away from, but it only hits in front of them in a cone, so simply standing behind them will allow you to continue to DPS. Final tip for this set, Boots and Thanatos mobs aggro by sound, so if you want to bypass them, consider toggling your RP walk. Other than that, just defeat mobs until the 10th floor. The boss for floor 10 is Gankanaw. This Mandragora has two simple mechanics that he rotates between. Authoritative Shriek causes four of the Mandragoras in the ground to light up before exploding in a large AoE. Just get away from any of the electric Mandragoras on the ground. Its other attack is Mandra Storm. This is a proximity AoE you should definitely step away from before doing three sets of three explosions with the Mandragoras in the room. Each column of three Mandys will go off one at a time with numbers over each set's head. So look at those numbers and dodge into them after the first set explodes. Now for floor 11 to 20. The monsters on this floor aren't much more threatening than the prior ones. There isn't anything overly dangerous, it's just avoiding AoEs. Note that all of the microsystem enemies aggro by proximity, so they're probably going to be your highest priority kill as you're going through. Ortho Hunters will also eventually haste themselves. They deal a bit more damage, but again, that shouldn't be that threatening. For the floor 20 boss, you'll be facing the cloning node. It does fire some line AoEs, but its primary mechanic is offensive command. This tethers to multiple dragons that fire conal AoEs from the edge of the arena. There are a number of patterns to this single command, but the rule of thumb is just to ensure that there are no dragons directly across from your location. While there are usually some safe spots closer to the boss, right next to a dragon on either side is almost always safe so long as there are none across from you, so resort to that even as a melee if you have to. Its other attack is Order Relay. This just does tethers for two sets of four dragons each before firing them off one at a time. For this one, the safe spots are very consistent. Just stand between all four of the tethers, usually with three on one side of you and one on the other. Once the first set goes off, move to the other spot in the second set with a similar setup and you should be fine. Just keep dodging dragons and line AoEs and you're all set. The cone AoEs are not lethal by the way, so bring some sustain and just ensure not to be hit by more than one at once and you should be okay. Floors 21 to 30 increase in difficulty considerably. They're not really that hard, but there's a lot more threatening AoEs to avoid and pay mind to. From this point on, this section is gonna get a lot longer as we need to break down most individual enemies. I'm only gonna focus on the really dangerous ones though. Ortho Demolishers are proximity aggro, and once they fall below 35%, begin channeling self-destruct. This will kill any player hit, much like the Behemoth Meteors. You can kill them, but you can also line of sight this safely. Other than that, they just do line AoEs. 
Orthodroids are also quite annoying. When not in combat, they will fire AoEs at you to avoid, so bear in mind how many of them are nearby, as it may mean a bit of dancing around to fight other monsters. You may also want to prioritize them as well. Now, Orthonites are very threatening. They have this long electromagnetism cast, which will pull players in range if they are hit. They immediately follow up with a point-blank AoE that deals huge damage to non-tanks. I'd advise respecting this as any non-tank, though with personal mitt and steel protomanders, it deals significantly less damage. But if your ether pool level is low, this will probably just one-shot you. Lesser Orthos dragons are also very threatening. They will turn to a random player and cast Swinge very early after pulling them. This will be untelegraphed at first, but it's a very deadly conal AoE. I advise staying very close to this mob or be ready to hide behind a nearby wall to prevent a lethal hit. As you progress through the floors, you'll run into another threatening enemy called a Venara. Now, Scythe Tail is its point-blank AoE, but if you're hit by it, the Venara will charge at you and do a follow-up hit. The damage from every hit is quite high, so any non-tank is likely to die, and tanks aren't exactly going to be loving it either. Just keep an eye out for them because the AoE is going to be delayed, so you need to be looking at that cast bar. Also on these upper floors are Vierves. When out of combat, they occasionally cast Bombination, which is a rapid room-sized AoE. It doesn't do a lot of damage, but it inflicts vulnerability up, so bear this in mind if multiple are in a room and you're already fighting something. Honestly, the rest of the mobs don't need any special mention, just handle them as you would. So we can discuss the floor 30 boss now, the Tiamat clone. This boss basically just fires a bunch of AoEs that all spawn dark dragon heads. These heads either move in a specific pattern or float towards player locations. Creature of Darkness summons several dragon heads in a row in front of Tiamat. Just look for an open space and avoid them. Next is Dark Wormtail or Dark Worm Wing. Wormtail hits in a line of AoE through the center of the room, while Worm Wing hits the east and west sides of the room. Just dodge them both accordingly. They do also spawn columns of dragon heads to avoid, so once again, just squeeze between them. Next is Dark Mega Flare. This places tons of circular AoEs on the ground that you'll need to avoid. Four dragon heads will spawn each time the Mega Flare hits, and it hits four times. They will float in the direction of random players, so it is a big dodge fest. When you're alone, that means they're all going for you, which might actually make it a little bit easier to bait them in specific directions. Finally, we have Waymorn. This fires five AoEs that follow the player after the initial hit, so it's usually a good idea to stand on one side of the room and just instantly run to the other side once the cast bar starts. Each AoE spawns a dragon head that floats towards a player. Right after the fifth hit is also either a Worm Tail or Worm Wing, so dodge that accordingly as well. Now keep dodging these attacks and you're all set. You'll get plus one to both your arm and armor regardless of level for every clear of this boss, as well as an Orthos Fragment to exchange for those potions and other stuff. If you're in a matched party, you'll be unable to progress past this point, so form a fixed party if you want to go any further. Floor 31 Plus is exclusive to fixed parties, and remember, if your duty failed before this or fails at any point going forward, you'll have to start from 1 or 21 again. Every boss from this point on also rewards another plus one to your arm and armor. Floors 31 to 40 isn't much harder than the last set, but the mobs are all dangerous and must be respected. Also a reminder that bronze chests can no longer be mimics starting on this floor. Instead, it's gonna be the silver chests. Your accursed hordes will also get an upgrade to silver on this floor set. First are mirror knights who have an AOE gaze and a follow-up. This gaze is all around the mirror knight, so ensure you look away respectfully. Then there are Ortho Spiders. These do a point-blank AoE called Particle Collision. Being hit will inflict Mini on you, which causes their follow-up attack, Needle Spacer, to become lethal. Stun it or duck back whenever you see that first cast bar. A few more floors further up are Nagas, which do another conal gaze to avoid at all costs, but they are patrols, so you want to keep an eye out for them. You'll also start encountering Orthotors, which are incredibly dangerous. 111 ton swing is a large point blank AoE, so get away from them during the cast. 11 ton swipe is a conal AoE in front of it, which it will do right after the swing. So if you get far enough away, it won't hit you or just be on his sides or behind him. Then there are ortho chimeras. These are like most of the normal chimeras, you know, Ram's voice means out, Dragon's voice means in. They also cannot be stunned or silenced and they aggro proximity. So these are a pretty high kill priority. Another of the threatening mobs are the Phantom Ortho Rays. Their forearming attack is a giant frontal AoE, so either get behind them or LOS it. 
Atmospheric Displacement is also a point-blank AoE, so step away when you see this casting. Ortho Impuses are also interesting. They occasionally try to run behind you and use Kneeing Snath. This is a knockback, so arm's length or just reposition to change the trajectory of that knockback. That was hard to say. Yeah, just don't get Lee Sin kicked by these things. Everything else is pretty standard. Just dodge AoEs and don't die. The Floor 40 boss is the Twintanya clone. There are a number of ways to die here, but none more obvious than Twister. At the end of this cast, Twintanya drops a wind landmine under every player's position. The placement location is decided a second or two before the cast ends, so the general rule of thumb is to stay moving near the later part of the cast and don't step back to where you were standing before or run behind another player for that matter. Next is Mericidian Cyclone. This just places a bunch of tornadoes around the room that persist for some time. Touching one, more touching the wall that's been there actually this whole time, will apply a powerful dot. It's survivable, but painful. During the Cyclones, Twintanya will use Mericidian Squall. This does four back-to-back -back placed AoEs under up to two players. Honestly, just don't get hit by one. Around the fourth Squall, Twintanya will go to the center and do Turbine, knocking everyone back. One single section of the arena is safe to be knocked back directly to, so just line up with it. Knockback resist doesn't work, but a well-timed gap closer will help negate it. After another Twister and a Mericidian Squall on every player, Twintanya will fly away and reappear somewhere along the outer edge. She then starts casting Twisting Dive, which will do a large AoE through the middle of the room. When this dive bomb finishes casting, it will also drop a Twister under every player. And yes, it will determine the location about a second or two before the cast actually finishes. So basically, dodge all the squalls, find the dive bomb, get out of its path, and then ensure you are moving as the twisting dive cast ends. Be sure to use the aggro list or your focus target in order to track it. After this, the fight is on repeat, and Twintanya will never use twisting dive a second time. Apparently, it's just a one-time thing in this fight. Now for floors 41 through 50. If you have capped ether pool, this floor might feel a bit easier than the rest but the rooms are far more claustrophobic, so keep on your toes. Keep in mind there are tons of enemies, and again, they are all threatening, but I'm largely focusing on attacks that are likely to kill you if you haven't seen them before. That means I won't be stopping to discuss every single AoE, so just keep your eyes open. Oh, and one specific warning, from this set all the way up to floor 80, there are some rooms that are shaped like big donuts with just the edge of narrow paths available, if the crystals along the wall kind of push you close to the center of the walkway, I'd advise turning around and crossing the room from the other way, if it's possible. There can be traps smack dab in this narrow path, so you're far more likely to hit something here, especially if the wall itself is pushing you closer to the middle. Since this type of room will continue for quite some time, it's better to get in the habit on these easier ones. Now on to the enemies. Bergthurs are a deceptively dangerous enemy. If a player ever steps behind them, they quickly cast Elbow Drop. This will one-shot anyone in a small cone behind them. Now you can bait it out to stop them from auto-attacking briefly, but you may want to consider just staying away from their rears altogether to avoid the risk. Acheron patrols on the early floors are mostly easy, but their Quake cast can be problematic if you have no interrupts. If you see it and there are no interrupts available, you'll need to line of sight this in order to avoid it. Up a few more floors are Kelpie patrols. They will target a player with Gallop before following up with Bloody Puddle after dashing to them. Puddle is an enormous point-blank AoE that extends outward in what looks to be a bit of an X pattern. Now you can stun these mobs, so consider stunning Gallop or the Puddle. If not, just as soon as a Kelpie runs towards a player, everyone should disperse from that location. Gooboos will also start showing up around the middle floors in this set. They will suck in players before doing a conal AoE in front of them. Just ensure that you're not directly in front of a Gooboo after it's suck in. It isn't very big of an AoE, so being far away from them works just fine if you didn't get sucked in. Kakulkins appear on the upper floors and are very similar to the Vierves a few floors back. They do a giant, quick cast room sized AoE that gives you a vault up. Just keep track of them so that you don't get hit too frequently. Mudmen are also around, though there's nothing threatening about them on their own. They occasionally do a point-blank heavy effect that does a little bit of damage as well. 
Now, this is fine if you're fighting them alone, but I'm only mentioning them because if you're fighting multiple enemies at the same time, that heavy is very significant and can definitely cause issues if you have more than one in a pack. The final tier of patrols here are Whorehounds, which cast Abyssal Cry after a short delay. You'll want to line of sight this one for sure, so be ready to run. Also, on the higher floors are Gelatos. Now, these don't do too much, but they will eventually prepare a long cast self-destruct if you take too long to kill them. So either line of sight this or focus them down first. With that, the most threatening mobs should all be covered, so on to the boss. 450 has you face the Servo Mechanical Chimera 14X. Definitely only saying that once. This is a basic Chimera fight mostly, but it has all new attack names and patterns. The first attack is the Song of Elements. This attack will either be called Songs of Thunder and Ice or Songs of Ice and Thunder. This is informing you on the order of the Chimera attacks and what it will do. So Song of Thunder and Ice means it will do Dragon's Voice into Ram's Voice and Ice and Thunder would be the opposite. There's also Left Breath Thunder and Right Breath Cold. These attacks are just half room AoEs with the Chimera hitting the half relative to which of these he casts. Ignore the Ice and Thunder part here, just look for left or right breath and you should be fine. Next is going to be either Cold Thunder or Thunderous Cold. This is a proximity charge on the target player, so stretch the tether until it's thin and purple. After the Chimera charges at the player, it will do the voices again based on the ability of the name, much like with the songs. So Cold means out and Thunder means in, and then just look at which is first and which is second. Finally is Cacophony, which just summons up to two lightning orbs that chase the tethered player. They explode when they untether, so just stay away from them the whole time and run away if you are the one tethered. Watch for another breath after this, and now you've seen all the mechanics. Just keep an eye on that Ice Thunder AoE name and you'll be all set. Floors 51 to 60 should also feel quite easy in terms of damage, but things will start getting harder after this set. However, the mobs can be super frustrating, so be very wary of the ones I mentioned. Starting off with a stressful one, first off are Emirs. These snail looking things almost immediately cast Gelid Charge after they're pulled. This gives them six seconds of the Ice Spikes buff, which will lethally damage any player who physically attacks them during this time. If you are anyone who physically hits a Emir, including a Red Mage melee combo, well, you know what? Just don't. Do not hit it during this time with physical attacks. Heck, I'd be scared about Book Smacks even. It will kill you, full stop. Now they can be stunned, but even if going for a stun, I'd back off and prepare to stop attacking anyway. Then you have Rockfin Patrols, which definitely need to be monitored carefully. They'll use Aqua Spear almost immediately upon being pulled, and you must line of sight this, or it is lethal. Ice sprites on this floor are also quite bothersome. They just spam Blizzard 1, and that's nothing wrong with that, but after they die, they'll begin channeling Hypothermal Combustion. This is a lethal point-blank AoE, so keep track of it on your aggro list or with focus target. Bear in mind that Lethargy Protomanders do affect the cast speed of this, so be extra careful if you have one of those up. They also won't cast it if they're petrified by Doga, but don't rely on that. Few more floors up and you get Leeches, which just do point-blank AoE Vulns. Just keep that in mind when chain-pulling monsters so you don't stack too high. Yabbies also start showing up after a few floors as patrols. Now they do a single target heavy that massively slows your movement speed before aiming an AoE at that same player. As soon as you see the heavy on you, just keep running away from your current spike and run forward, back doesn't matter, just don't stand still. Sprint helps a lot, but just go, go, go. Now you'll start running into Claws and Crack Claws too. These two crabs look similar, but they function completely differently. Crack Claws are really easy. They just do like this triple hit extra attack, so they deal a little more single target damage. Whereas the Claws have several AoEs. The most dangerous claw attack is Crab Dribble, which functions similarly to Elbow Drop, but it is a bigger AoE. So just don't go behind the claws and you should be fine. Now floor 57 plus has some really dangerous new mobs to track. Stingrays will jump onto a random player and knock away any other nearby player. It means they're practically safer to fight solo. After they jump, they will either do a point blank or donut AOE, so ensure you don't get knocked into a room and make sure you respond to that follow up. Monks will also patrol around. They use Sucker, which pulls players in before following up with a point blank AOE. 
you can actually walk out of this one. It's not like electromagnetism. So if you get pulled in, just keep running. You can also use knockback resist on the sucker cast, line of sight the sucker cast, and like I said, you can also run away. But if you're fighting more than one at once, be very careful. If they have staggered suckers, that can very quickly end the run for you. Finally, the Zeratins do a sewer water AoE. Now this is a two part AoE, even though you only get one AoE indicator. It'll always hit on the opposite side of the Zeratin after the first hit. So it'll either hit front, then back, or back, then front. Either way, just make sure you avoid both hits or even outrange the entire thing. Now that's it for the majorly threatening mobs. So onto the floor 60 boss, the Servo Mechanical Minotaur 16. Also only saying that once. This has all the usual Minotaur stuff. You know, bullish swing attacks are point blank AoEs. Bullish swipe is a long conal AoE. And disorienting groan is a knockback from the center of the room. However, the main mechanic is octuple swipe. This does eight back to back swipes displayed one at a time before they're executed. These fortunately only occur in one of two patterns. It will either hit the exact same pattern back to back. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four or it will do it in reverse. We call that the race car pattern. One, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. It also always alternates between the two. So after you see the first one, they're really easy to keep track of. After the first octuple, the Minotaur will also do Thunder Call with any other ones that he does, which actually does a decent amount of room-wide damage as a warning. It also summons a ton of Thunder Orbs that explode in small AoEs around them around the first time the first swipe happens in octuple. So simply avoid the first swipe and all the orbs, then do the rest of your octuple normally. Other than that, it's just those basic minotaur attacks I mentioned, and you should be fine. On to 61 to 70, where stuff starts to get a little bit more painful if you're not a tank, and might start taking a little longer to kill again. The enemies, however, aren't as generally dangerous, minus a few specific ones. Most are just dodgeable AoEs. The big thing here, though, is that mimics will now come exclusively from gold chests and can no longer be stunned. If you don't have access to an interrupt, Pox will become your friend very soon. Now, the early floors have Terox, which do this stacking poison. It's not too bad unless it stacks up too high. Then there's the Matamatas, which just do giant conals to avoid. Not a big deal. And the Diplomachus enemies, which are only bad if you're fighting multiple enemies at once. Their peculiar light AoE gives any nearby enemies a 50% evasion boost permanently until they die, which can be uber frustrating on your kill speeds, especially if you also happen to get blind on that floor. Try to ensure that these are fought alone and out of range of everything else. The Cobras on the early floors are probably the most dangerous. They have Whip Back, which is just like Elbow Drop. So watch their rears. They do also give nearby players a Vuln up on death, and they do also do an aimed AoE, but honestly, the Whip Back is the really dangerous thing. A few more floors up are Gowrows. These do a frontal and rear conal that have no cast bar. If you see them raising their claws, it is the front facing conal, so get away. If they lift their tail, it's the rear facing one, so avoid and avoid. There will also be Orthro Ninjas. Now on aggro, they jump to a player and attempt to use Death Blossom. It's just an AoE to walk out of, so just step out of it. But they do have one little hidden trait. If the player's health ever falls below 25%, the ninja will jump to them and assassinate them instantly. Now, tank invulns do prevent this death, but you don't ever want to be put in this situation, so don't fight them if you're low on health. In fact, just stay high on health. This set also has drakes, which are similar to the emirs in the previous set. When you see smoldering scales cast, stop hitting them with physical attacks. It can be stunned, but again, be careful, don't be overconfident. The middle floors here aren't too bad. Basilisks have a conal gaze and a point blank AoE to avoid, and the Haukas do a frequent knockback, so just ensure that they don't knock you into anything dangerous. There are also the Phallics. These do a huge donut AoE called Kachexia. If anyone's even out of range, if no one's out of range, it really just doesn't do anything. So on its own, that's not too bad, but it can be incredibly dangerous when paired with the nearby Paleons. These frogs will tongue a player into their range before doing a point blank AoE called Body Press. They also instantly go for a Body Press if they're stunned when they become unstunned. So if you get pulled in, run away, or just run away anytime you see that cast bar going off. But if you happen to have a Paleon and a Phallic at the same time, I would highly advise throwing a Witching out there, because that can just put you in unwinnable circumstances sometimes. Other than that, you should be all good, so on to the floor 70 boss, Eterna. 
Steel Claw is a single target damage buster, but given its deep dungeon, it actually doesn't do that much damage. Its first big attack is Ferocity. This will place a proximity tether on a player before jumping at them to deal damage. Be sure to stretch the tether all the way until it's a thin purple line, like on the floor 50 boss. After that, a turner will use Preternatural Turn, which can have one of two effects. If a turner has a massive etheric glow around them, it'll be a donut AoE. If not, it'll be a point blank AoE. Watch the animation and react accordingly. The other major attack is Roar. This deals some damage and causes tons of AoEs to drop under the players around the arena. The larger AoEs leave behind crystals, but note that one crystal is always a bit further away from the center of the room, and that's the major way of identifying the safe spot for the follow-up attack. A turner then jumps to the middle and uses preternatural turn again. This will hit the crystals and cause them to explode, with a different kind of AoE depending on which preternatural turn occurs. If it's the donut AoE version, you'll want to safely stand within the hitbox, but just a few steps off the edge of the hitbox ring as you see here. You also want to be perfectly between the crystal that is far away and the center of the boss hitbox. These crystals will become point blank explosions, which is why it creates this particular safe spot. If it's the point blank preternatural turn, you'll instead want to stand to the far left and right of that off put crystal. This avoids the point blank AoE and the apparent conal AoE that each crystal will fire outward when they are hit. The crystal explosions are not always lethal, but you really don't want to be taking them to the face. Now just do all those attacks on repeat and you're all set. Floor 71 to 80 is next and in my opinion, this is the most dangerous set of 10 floors by a wide margin. There are tons of ways to just get ganked by enemies, so be extra vigilant and attentive. Accursed Hordes will also be gold from this point on. For the first few floors, Toko Tokos are by far the least threatening. Their conal attack slow call isn't even lethal, although you'll wish you were dead when you have one minute of double the GCD. I'd say prioritize them for kills if nothing else is blocking your path and don't stand in front of them when you see slow call casting. Primalifus are the first thing that are threatening. They will charge at a player and do a very fast point blank AoE afterwards. So step away from them whenever they charge. They can be stunned, but again, don't rely on that. Unicorns do a triple knockback and a targeted AoE. I'd advise using knockback resist if it's available just a second or two after pulling them. They start doing those knockbacks pretty quickly. And also just make sure you don't get knocked into the middle of the room or another enemy. Coworls lurk about on the early floors as patrols. They have a huge frontal AoE, so be sure to stay closer, line of sight if you really have to. But they, of course, have Tail Whip, which will hit behind them as well. This one is actually huge, so you really want to make sure you're actually on this thing's flanks or in front of it if you ever see Tail Whip casting. Now, Gulo Gulo starts showing up quickly into the first few floors, and as of this video, can be the single most dangerous enemy in all 100 floors due to a bug. Their main attack is Killing Paw, which does a conal AoE in front of them. After a short delay, they'll do another hit, which will aim in the exact same spot and be just as lethal as the first. Normally, you just don't step back in front of them and you're absolutely fine. However, I have seen a clip of them just deciding that we're just going to walk up to you and do an unavoidable version of this. This somehow appears to be linked to their auto attack going off before the follow up swipe. So if you're alone, I'd avoid them as best as possible. And if in a group, don't be surprised if somebody dies. It sucks, but hopefully it'll be fixed soon. 74 plus will start seeing Thunder Beast patrols, which have two very deadly attacks. If any player is out of range, it may use Spark, which is just a really big donut AoE. Now you can also line of sight it if someone's really far away, but the bottom line is it won't even use this if people aren't even in range, so you'd want to stay close to it, right? Well, it can also use Scythe Tail like the Venaras on the earlier floors, but this time without a cast bar. After two or three autos, if you see the Thunder Beast kind of kneel down, it's preparing Scythe Tail to use shortly after. If Spark casts, then this will happen right after Spark finishes. If no one is out of range, it will skip using Spark and just use Scythe Tail right away. Be very, very careful. It does stop moving during the animation, so you can easily get away, but you have to be paying attention. And if you have a Lethargy on, they're going to be kneeling down for a long time, so be very careful. You'll also start seeing Cargus Griffins shortly after this. They aggro by sight, a far cry from their proximity aggro in previous deep dungeons, but they still function largely the same. 
They will use Free Fall twice, a large AoE on a random player that you'll need to avoid. After this, they will cast Winds of Winter, which will be lethal if you are hit. You can either stun it or it must be line of sighted. Those are the only two ways to counter it <laughs> or just kill it, I guess. Bird of Orthos will use Eye of the Fierce, which is a gaze attack to avoid from any direction. If you avoid it, the bird is pretty much harmless, but any one hit will be confused before being targeted by revelation shortly after. This is an unavoidable, lethal AoE on the target player. It can be stunned, but the bird will try it repeatedly until the player is unconfused. Best to run away from that player and let them die alone and finish the bird off afterwards. From floor 76 up, you'll start encountering Sasquatch mobs. These are the most dangerous mobs in this set and almost any set of floors. They will, once a minute, eat a ripe banana, do a little monkey noise, which is a good warning thing to listen for, and then they'll get a damage buff. Shortly after that, they will use a giant, more than one room-sized AoE that, if it connects, will instantly kill the affected player. Now, it can be line of sighted, so you may see it pop up on your screen, but there could still be a wall between you and the monkey, so you might be okay. And I highly advise playing around those walls as you're actually progressing, especially if you don't know if there's a monkey in the room you're about to go into just yet. The good news is that not only can it be line of sighted, but this only occurs out of combat. So as soon as you pull a Sasquatch, it won't use this attack. It'll charge at the player, and if it has the damage up, it'll do you know a little more damage. But once they're in combat, they're largely harmless. Just dodge their stool pelt and you'll be okay. I just recommend that if you see that it's safe to pull one, pull one immediately. And if there's more than one in a room, get as far back, line of sight, whatever you can do to get safely away. You just wanna be using those little bits of downtime to eliminate them as problems altogether. So they are a top pull priority in every single room, especially in the exit room. Now there are also Skatines, which use a deadly attack called Chirp. It's fairly sizable as a point blank and has no AOE indicator at all. If you see it casting, ensure you run far away and even just line of sight it. Don't play fast and loose with this one. But the good news is they actually aggro by sound, so you can just RP walk past them if you want to. Flame Beasts are also threatening, but not that bad. They turn to a player and use Blistering Roar, which is a massive line AoE in front of the beast. Just get behind it or LOS it if you see it casting, and don't tank them too close to walls if you're with a group. Last thing you want is it turning towards a player that's on its flank and having no way of avoiding it. Now, the other new mobs on these higher floors aren't too bad. You know, the wolves do a bit more damage with the bleed that they apply. There are more ortho ninjas, but they're called ortho kenochis this time, and they do more single target damage, so it runs the risk of you getting lower on health. But other than that, you should just be focusing on dealing with the Sasquatches. The floor 80 boss is Proto Kalia, which I'd also argue is one of the toughest set bosses other than the final one. Its basic attacks are all cleaves, and its resonance AoE buster actually starts to hit a bit hard, so watch your health here. The big mechanics are Barrow Field and Jets. Anytime Barrow Field or Nano Spore Jets is cast, the boss will gain a danger zone in their hitbox. Do not cross through the boss hitbox at all until the next sequence is finished. Even then, probably better to just never walk through the boss's hitbox here. Nano Spore Jets will spawn four laser cannons on the cardinal sides of the room. These will fire line AoEs directly through the room, in the same spots every single time the whole fight. They pulse at regular intervals during nanospore jets, but I'll make mention of that when the time comes. They also all have electrical charges, and that's something you'll need for a mechanic later. Kalia will then start using nerve gas over and over again. Each of them has a different name and will aim in a different direction based on said name. Centralized nerve gas is a conal in front of Kalia. Now, if there isn't a target in front of Kalia, then Kalia will turn to face them, so you will always have to avoid this. Leftward Nerve Gas hits in a 180 degree area from Kalia's front left hitbox to the back right. So it's not just the left side. The front of the boss for a little bit is safe. I mean, you can see it on the screen right now. Rightward Nerve Gas is the opposite, back left to top right of the hitbox. For left and right, Kalia's front is completely safe. So most people will opt to stand in front of Kalia unless centralized Nerve Gas is used, and then they'll dodge that accordingly. The cannons will fire during every cast of Nerve Gas after the first, so during the second, third, fourth, and fifth casts of Nerve Gas in the middle of it casting. 
If Kalia is faced towards an intercardinal, you'll be safe from everything unless centralized nerve gas is used. So I recommend trying to aim Kalia that way. In case you do need to cross a cardinal, wait until after the lasers fire and then make your move. If you stay close to Kalia, it's not a whole lot of movement. During the fourth nerve gas cast, any players present will be given an electrical charge and be tethered to a cannon as well. Remember, opposites attract and sames repel in case you somehow don't know how a magnet works yet. The fifth nerve gas will be a donut AOE instead of any of the other ones, so you'll want to resolve your tether in such a way that you are pushed or pulled close to Kalia without being hit by the barrow field. There will be one final set of cannons going off here too, so aim for the intercardinals if possible, but you can dodge the lasers last second if you need to. And even then, they shouldn't be lethal as long as you have a decent amount of health. But either way, this is probably the most difficult part of this boss, and you just need to be able to do this over and over again until Kalia eventually falls. Now we're closing in on the finish line with floors 81 through 90. Now from this point on, no more protomanders of raising will come from gold chests. Whatever raisings you have left will be what you carry to the end. So hopefully you held on to a few. However, demi clones become more common here. So you may have some relief with that. Not to mention with raisings not being possible, it's just a better chance at getting something like a lethargy, a dread or a storms, which honestly helps a lot more. Line of Sight is also much harder to achieve here, but fortunately you don't need it for any mechanics. It's just something that you can't fall back on in the case that you make a mistake. You can kind of LOS, I guess, with the hilly pads, and I think some of the like thin and narrow walls and pillars can be used, but it's very, very difficult to do consistently, and I wouldn't advise that. Just stay close to most of the enemies, unless I mention doing otherwise. The Katobal Paws are the first things you'll probably notice. They do these giant room-sized petrification gaze AoEs. They're fortunately not lethal on their own, but you still don't want to be staring directly into the demon eye. So if you see them charging a gaze AoE from another room, just turn around and make sure you don't look at them. Once they're in combat, they will still use it with a cast bar, but you know, it's not any more threatening than any other gaze AoE. Just don't look at them. The Hecked Eyes will also do a Gaze AoE, though this one is a point blank, very small range. If you are hit, it will follow up with Death Ray and kill you, so melee range players, look away. They also explode if not killed quickly enough with the Catharsis skill, so focus them down first, or even outrange the Catharsis if you can. Courses roam the halls on the early floors as patrols. They jump at players and then aim a glass punch conal AOE at a random player in range. Doesn't have to be the player they actually jump to. It's a short conal, so as long as you're not in front of them, or even if you got far enough away, it shouldn't be a problem. They also shoot catapult AOEs at players to dodge, but that's same old, same old. Persona mobs teleport to you on pull and do a massive conal AOE, so stay close. They also do a point blank AOE if they stay alive long enough, so just be sure to avoid that as well. A few floors up and you'll start running into Deep Eyes. They do a Gaze AoE to look away from, which inflicts a nasty Paralyze. They also pulse an AoE Vuln stack occasionally, so don't let that stack up too much. Abyss mobs are also quite easy. Dodge their aimed AoE and just deal with their double autos and you should be fine. Puddings do a giant conal AoE, followed by an eventual aimed AoE. I've never seen one of these attempt to explode like the gelatos on the earlier floor, but I guess just keep it in mind in case I got lucky. I've had them survive for pretty long, so I just don't think they can do that. The Gubus are back as well, but now they're called Gormans, and they work largely the same. They'll pull you in and then follow it up with a frontal conal AoE. They also do a large AoE aimed at a player, so step out of the moldy phlegm as well. Spar toys are next. They jump on a player and do a massive Umbra Smash AoE, which is then followed up by a Conal. Get behind or far away from these when you see them casting Triple Trial, which is the Conal. Ahriman starts showing up in the back half as well, and these do a massive line AoE in the direction of a random player. It is vital that you do not aim this directly down the line of one of the narrow walkways, as it can make the attack completely unavoidable for any player who's not close enough to get behind it. In other words, get close enough to get behind it. Also, don't tank them on the walls and then aim them opposite of that, much for the same reasons like I talked about with the Flame Beasts. Then there's Pegasus mobs, which will do an AoE charge at a random player before doing a large point-blank AoE. Get away from them as soon as the charge finishes. 
Then you have Wraiths, which are similar to most other Wraiths in the game. Scream is a huge point blank AoE, so run very far away when it starts casting. They also follow that up with Ancient Eruption on a random player. So just dodge the AoE that leaves behind. The biggest difference between them and other Wraiths is that these ones can't be silenced. So you just have to do these AoEs normally. In my opinion, the scariest monsters on this set of floors, especially for a light party, are the Ortho Spectres on the upper floors. They do a left or right sweep, which hits in a 210 degree area towards the named side. Ensure that you fight these in the middle of pathways to ensure there is actually a safe spot to dodge to. They will also use either ringing or surrounding burst. Ringing is a donut AoE and surrounding is a point blank. Weird confirmation bias here, I've only ever seen ringing. I only know about surrounding because I've seen it on other people's streams. So thank goodness for that. Any other mob not mentioned here is one that's just very simple to deal with, but I named almost everything. So let's move on to the boss, the administrator, who actually just has three main mechanics on repeat. Support systems number one will summon a line of box drones, a sphere drone, and an egg drone, all called interceptors, alpha, beta, and gamma in the aggro list, which you can use to actually track the cast bar. Administrator will place a number over each of them to indicate what order their AoEs go off. The box drones do a half room AoE, so be on the opposite side from that. The sphere does a donut AoE, and the egg does a conal. You just need to dodge these in the order they are marked. It also ends with either cross lasers or peripheral lasers from the boss itself. Cross lasers means you stand along the corners of the box the boss forms from their lasers, while peripheral is a donut AoE, so get under the boss. After support systems number one is a laser stream, which does significant room-wide damage. I've seen low ether pool people just get one shot by this, so definitely make sure to mitigate it if you're doing a low ether pool climb. Support systems number two summons box drones all along the edge. Each row or column will fire one at a time with the same sort of lasers that they use in support systems one. So you just need to avoid them as they go off. There will also be AOEs aimed at every player. So it's easy to accidentally cut your allies off if playing with a party. My personal recommendation is to stand between two rows or columns and just run along it and dodge everything along the way. You can do this any number of ways, just don't get hit, smile. Support systems number three is two egg drones and tons of box drones. Now there should be four squares in the arena, much like in this diagram, that are completely safe from the box drones, but the egg drones will aim their AOEs in such a way that only one of these is half safe. So depending on how the egg drones are aimed, you'll need to find the safe square and get along the outer edge of it like you see here. If the eggs are aiming away from the corner they are both closest to, that's the safe side. If one of the eggs is aiming towards this corner, you go to the corner next to the egg that's actually aiming towards the center of the room. And if they both aim towards the corner that they are closest to, you instead go directly across the arena. I've never had that last one happen, but given the pattern of the box drones, that one should technically be possible. Once you do all three of these patterns, they will repeat until the boss is dead. Finally, we are at 91 to 100. This set is nearly equal in difficulty to 71 to 80, but fortunately, you can go nuts with whatever protomanders you have left. I advise saving Serenity protomanders for floors that are massively debilitating. No items, no abilities, no demi-clones, for example. But feel free to use almost all of your protomanders by floor 98. You're only going to want a few specific ones for floor 99. Demi-clones also become incredibly common from silver chests on this floor set. I've never seen an actual Aetherpool upgrade even appear, only explosions and demi-clones. I only know that they can even happen because somebody else told me they had it happen. So just expect a lot of friendos to be joining you and expect to use them so you don't overcap on friendos. Mining drones are up first. These do four back-to-back -back AOE charges that also knock back. Shields mitigating the damage or knockback prevention help, but keep your backs to the nearby edges to stop yourself from going into a room. After that, it will face a random party member and do a massive 180 degree AOE. Stay close, get behind, and you're good. And please do not bait it in such a way that the back of the enemy is to a wall, which can be kind of tough to do given all the knockbacks. Orthodrones fire line AoEs, but they also self-destruct after being killed. They're basically slightly harder versions of Ice Sprites, so just get away from them when they die and watch the cast on that aggro list. Ortho System Alpha are the egg-shaped drones. They do massive conal AoEs, so stay close and get behind them when they start casting. 
Ortho system gammas are the sphere drones. These proximity patrols do high voltage, a massive AOE. Now, if you can interrupt it, then go ahead. If not, you can just simply outrange it. It's pretty large if it finishes casting, but you can actually get out of it. So I recommend staying close to your starting room when you're fighting these, so you have plenty of space to run back to if need be. After high voltage goes off, there will either be ringing cannon, which is a donut AOE, or repelling cannon, which is a point blank AOE. So look at the name of the skill and dodge those accordingly as well. Mother Bits will start showing up a couple of floors in, but it's a pretty easy mob. It does an aimed AoE followed up by Citadel Buster. This is actually a very narrow line AoE in the direction the bit aims the Citadel laser. So just don't be directly in front of it and you're fine. Orthotaurs also start wandering around and are similar to most Minotaurs. 32 ton swipe is a long and narrow conal, but stay close and avoid it safely. Shortly after swipe, the Orthotaur will charge at a random player before doing 128 ton swing, a point blank AoE. Now the cast on that is quite fast, so as soon as you see the charge, start running away from it. The next major threats are the Zagnals. These behemoth looking mobs are similar to the Sasquatches in 71 to 80, except they don't eat a banana first. They just occasionally have a giant lethal AoE with a tiny cast bar. So you really need to watch their animations and track when the last time they used it was. Wait to see them use the AoE and then make them a pull priority. They also do Pounce Errant on a random player, which will do a massive knockback if anyone other than the target player is hit. Spread out or use knockback resist if you think you're gonna take that extra hit. Another floor or two up are ortho chimeras, which are souped up chimera style mobs. It will charge at a player before doing rams or dragon's voice. It will also do a mostly untelegraphed breath or tail attack. Dragon's breath is a large left cleave, which does hit a decent bit in front of the chimera itself. Same goes for Ram's Breath, which will hit the right side, and Scorpion Sting is one of those rear AoEs. It also has Engulfing Cold, which is a massive frontal AoE. So, you know, outside of Ram's Voice, it's pretty much just a good idea to always stand next to these things, but they are incredibly dangerous. Mithridates have a 270 degree conal AoE, with the only safe spot being behind them. So, get behind them. They are also stunnable, which helps a ton. Sphinx are next. They open with a gaze AoE in front of them, so just look away. They also immediately follow up with Swinge, so stay close to them and get behind them when you see Swinge casting. Dreadnoughts show up next, and these should be familiar to you a bit by now. Rotoswipe is a conal AoE in front, so get behind, and Wrecking Ball is an AoE to avoid, so avoid it. Though I don't think I've ever actually seen one of these ones use Wrecking Ball, but all the same. Steam Clean is a quick cast point blank AoE that also grants the Dreadnought a damage buff. I'd recommend just using a stun on this if you have one, otherwise you'll probably be kiting them around and it won't be that big a deal. Next are Durgas, the Avatar looking ones. They have a massive conal AoE, so definitely stay close. Shortly after that, they will use Brain Jack, which is an unavoidable short duration Confuse, followed up by an AoE aimed at the Confused player. Just move out of the AoE after the Confusion wears off. These are really only threatening if you're too far away or if you have multiple mobs pulled since the confusion could easily get you killed in that case. Finally, we have Fitters. Out of combat, they are much like the Sasquatches and the Zagnals, so watch for their unholy cast before entering a room with them. In combat, they do an AoE gaze attack to avoid. I've never actually been hit by it, so I don't know what they do if you do get hit. I don't know if it's just lethal or they do a follow-up attack, but how about you just don't look at the monster and not worry about that? With that, you are on to floor 99, which is actually a boss. For the first time ever in a deep dungeon, Eureka Orthos has a boss in the final set of 10 floors, though this time it is on the ninth floor. Floor 99 has you face Excalibur. He has one big mechanic to track and a few AoEs to avoid as well. When you pull, he will use Paradoxum, which is a room-wide AoE that grants every player either an ice or fire debuff. This debuff means that if you are hit by the same element again, you will instantly die, whereas being hit by the opposite element will change your element safely. Your goal in this fight is to avoid ever being hit by the same one twice, which may mean deliberately being hit by certain attacks to change your element to the opposite one. After Paradoxum, he will use Caliburn. The first time using it will fire a line of swords directly in front of him, which will return across the arena after a brief delay. 
Before that happens, Excalibur will jump to a side of the arena perpendicular to his own swords and begin charging Thermal Divide. This places a lethal AoE down the center of the room, but on each side of it, his animation will show either an ice or fire sword. You basically want to stand on the side that is opposite your element and out of that center AoE altogether. Once this goes off, your element should swap and you can wait for the swords to pass through the center of the room before the next mechanic. After this, the boss will jump back to the middle of the room and use Call Dimension Blade, which starts phase two. He will start this phase with empty or solid Souls Caliber. Empty means donut AoE, solid means point blank, so dodge accordingly. He will also do one of two other AoE patterns alongside it, either large conal AoEs from the center aimed at the boss's cardinal directions relative to the direction it's facing, or several of these half rings all over the place. Generally staying near the boss's intercardinals, whether it's in or out, and using sprint gives you more than enough space to dodge these regardless of the pattern. Just be ready to quickly move for the follow-up. The final mechanic in phase two is Caliburn Paradoxum. Excalibur will use Caliburn first. This Caliburn will always be aimed in front of him as well as back left and back right of wherever he's looking. These will eventually return the other way like before, but Excalibur will use Paradoxum before doing this. This not only assigns the players an element, but two of the sword sets will also be assigned an element each. This is important to track as there is a chance you will need to be hit by a single sword. The boss will cast Flame Forge or Frost Forge charging their sword with that same element. You need to ensure that your elemental debuff is the opposite of whichever skill is used before the next Souls Caliber attack. If your element is already opposite, for example, he's using Flames Forge and you have an ice debuff, then you're fine. You just need to avoid all the swords altogether. If your element is the same as his sword, then you'll need to be hit by a single opposite element sword. I recommend running up to the set of swords you need to be hit by and just inching over to ensure you're only hit by one. Being hit by two is gonna instantly kill you. You can also stand opposite and do the same thing. It's just whatever floats your boat. After this, dodge the empty or solid souls caliber and there will be a room wide right after that hits for the boss's forged element. If you mess up the sword AOEs before, you're gonna die here, but if not, it still actually does a decent amount of damage, so don't ignore it. Once that's done, there's one more mechanic depending on which sword was forged. Flame Forge spawns several fire AoEs that go off when they expand to full, so for this you just need to dance around and avoid being hit. Frost Forge summons two sets of three omnidirectional line AoEs. There are several different patterns and different ways to avoid them, but fortunately, if you stand in any spot that looks like where you see this person standing, that should be safe from all possible patterns. It's dead center in this pizza slice I've outlined, right on the point where these lines converge on the arena floor. After both sets of ice have gone off, do the thermal divide correctly and you're all good. From this point, the mechanic just repeats until the boss is dead. But you aren't done yet. You actually have to go to floor 100 and run down to the Orthos tombstone at the bottom before the instance timer wears off. It's important to remember that you can time out here and fail even if you beat the boss. And the run itself is just a bit under 80 seconds. So ensure you have about this amount of time available at the end. Range Fizz, use your Pelotons and Ninja. You're gonna run a little faster plus Shikuchi, but try not to cut it too close. Upon clearing floor 100, every player in the party will obtain one Orthos Tombstone. These can be exchanged at the NPCs nearby for a number of rewards, but most importantly are the four accessories you can get. Individually, each accessory is just glam and doesn't provide any additional benefit. However, if you talk to Ko with all four of them equipped, you can actually earn Eterna, the floor 70 boss, as a mount. Now you may also want the furniture and the framer kit, so you're looking at six clears to get absolutely everything from this particular reward structure. Not to mention, you may also want to work on the solo achievement. This video didn't really focus on soloing, more focused on the overall rewards and the overall structure of this deep dungeon, but hopefully it was of some help to you all the same. And with that, I'm finally done with this video. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and I hope I never have to make a video this long ever again. <laughs> Until next time, take care.